Hello, hello, my lovelies, and welcome back to Strange Playgrounds. Welcome back to our series on the Black Shuck Shadows series of books. These are, I am, I, I at the moment what I'm doing is I am, whenever I get paid, I am going onto the Black Shuck website and I'm just ordering like three of these at a time because they love they're such lovely elegant little volumes that you could just power through them you can read I can read one of these in in a day sometimes so usually what I tend to do is space one out over a week and then read it throughout the week because they're such wonderful little elegant collections you can do that this next one is actually book four in the series this is by um our, by a writer I'm sure many of you will be aware of Paul Kane who has written so 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 much including a series of novels on um, on Clive Barker's Hellraiser series in which he uh, intermingles Sherlock Holmes with the Hellraiser series and it works very, very, very well. Uh, Paul's collection is... Again, I say this every time because it. I really want to emphasise just how broad and how various the collections in this series are there is this tendency certainly from people outside the genre to condemn horror as you know largely all being the same and as being formulaic as being very genre specific and conformist these series demonstrate the folly of that they really do I mean, thus far, everything we've reviewed has been dramatically different in tone, in theme, uh, structure, just the way the stories are. And the same is true here. Paul Kane's series, uh, series, The Life Cycle, is again another completely different piece of work. It's actually, rather than being, it is a collection of short stories, it is, but rather than being interrelated by a common theme these actually all involve both the same mythology and the same characters it's called the life cycle because that's exactly what it follows it follows the life cycle of a particular character a guy named neil who happens to be a werewolf all of the stories are self-contained you can read them individually if you want so they function as short stories you know um but they are they are part of a whole and in order to get that notion of the life cycle you need to read them together and so, sort of in order and it's very clever it's very very clever what you've got uh, something paul has done which i really i think is very clever he hasn't really belabored himself explaining too much like the characters are not that concerned with what they are in terms of its significance. You know how there's a tendency, certainly in vampire fiction, uh, certainly postmodern vampire fiction, if you go and read short story collections that are, involve vampirism, like, for example... Um, uh, Love in Vain, which is a great collection, by the way, a collection of erotic uh, vampire stories, um, which was edited by Billy Martin, a.k.a. Poppy Z. Bright. Really fantastic collection. What tends to happen is the characters are obsessed with ruminating on the nature and philosophy of what they are. Because these guys, the characters in uh, the life cycle are werewolves, they're not really. The, the, the whole thing about this is atavism. Certainly in the early stories, like Nightly life for example because nightlife starts not at the beginning but at, at a point where neil is quite young the characters around him are quite young so it's all about atavism it's about appetite it's about the carnal drive you know and and what paul has done is related that to werewolf mythology and the werewolves in the life cycle they are it's hard to say what they are because there's nothing that really takes any great pains to explain it it's not about that it's not interested in explaining like oh it's a virus oh it's a curse oh it's this oh it's that they're just creatures they are just a kind of almost cuckoo like species that live amongst and alongside human beings and they they are very atavistic what he's done he's related the the, the sort of innate atavism of the werewolf, so the the animalistic hunger, the lack of control, the, the bestial qualities of the werewolf to um, human appetite, so sexuality, desire, the almost like the rapine inclination. And that's very clever. It's kind of like, um, it's a very male book, because it's from the perspective of Neil, and in the beginning, his pack, I suppose, the people, the other werewolves, the other young werewolves that he hangs around with, and their hunting grounds, certainly in nightlife 
are nightclubs. They are exactly what it says on the tin. On, on the tin, they are. It's the places where young people hang out, where there are, where there is prey, essentially. And it's very interesting to note that they prey primarily on women. So it's like they're. It's like their sexuality and their their state as werewolves is intermingled. Like the the physical hunger for meat and for flesh and for blood, it's it's intermingled with the desire for for sex. You know, they're both carnal drives that are consummated at the same time, and that's really interesting. Really interesting. There's almost like a a commentary on the nature of males, uh, certainly straight male sexuality here and it's a very straight book as well this one i mean it's um it is really about straight male sexuality a lot of the time and you often don't get that that's that's something that's very interesting and i think it's something that should be explored more something like werewolf mythology is so well placed to do that on a metaphorical level and i think and paul gets that i mean he very very clearly gets that but what he's also exploring here is age how people respond to the fact of their own aging and mortality it's different for the werewolves because they age slower they are almost immortal they can endure a lot that other that not certainly normal human beings can't that was my cat by the way there was a little cameo by rufus who's being a pain in the ass um they can endure a lot of punishment that other human beings can't they also are kind of resistant to disease but there's also other stuff here so for example the uh the first the first story is actually a growing up story it's kind of sad you do get the um the, the sort of atavistic stuff and it's very celebratory and very dark and wonderfully amoral that's something i like about the book as well it doesn't it doesn't belabor itself really thinking about the morality of it it just goes for it and it, it's really kind of exploring the atavism of it all but it does burn out uh, the interesting thing about it is that it does burn out. You get this kind of realization happening in this book, and it's in the second story, Half Life, really, where it happens. It's it's very, very, very dark indeed. You get like it's almost like approaching middle age where everything starts to fall apart where things change where social dynamics change that's what's happening in half-life after the the intense atavism of nightlife things are slowly 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 falling apart the pack is split apart and they're all doing their own things now they have become people that they don't really recognize uh it's all from the perspective of neil and neil has now kind of settled down neil has just kind of he's become domestic he's become domesticated he doesn't really do what the others do anymore and he's got a, a girlfriend who's expecting a baby um and it's incredibly tragic it also sets up this notion that there are people who hunt the werewolves in this instance someone is picking them off one by one and the reason for it as it turns out is incredibly sad because it's it's sort of a rod they've made for their own back. I mean, something truly awful happens in this short story. I won't reveal it. I won't spoil it. But in, in Half-Life, something really terrible happens that shatters Neil's existence. And basically what it's what it's metaphorically exploring is what happens when when you're approaching sort of middle age and then something tragic happens to shatter your life and how difficult it is to put it back together at that age. So it's like having a divorce, it's like having a trauma, it's like having a bereavement all at once. It's really sad. It's really, really, really sad. And despite the fact that these creatures are very atavistic and very murderous by their nature, they prey on human beings, you know, they eat human beings, you do feel for Neil, you feel for him, because his experience, it really is something that most men, I think, will be able to relate to, whether you're straight or not. Because that's what Paul's looking at he's taking a backward step and looking at the life cycle you know he's looking at how appetite and how inspiration and how the desire for life you know the id the drive for existence the erotic impulse slowly fades and is traumatized and bludgeoned out of you over time by experience um and by the time lifetime rolls around it actually starts to get really sad because at this point, Neil is the older guy, the disappointed guy, the one who has been through it all and kind of knows everything and is really sad and disappointed and is seeing 
the same cycles play out for others. He's actually noted, he goes back to his old town um, where everything happened and he notices that there is another werewolf pack there. There's another pack of very young werewolves who are doing the same thing and making the same mistakes as he did and him and his pack and are drawing negative attention to themselves. And it's, it's about the relationship between the young and the old. It's about that generational divide. And Neil tries his best to warn them. He tries his best to impart his experience in his own imperfect way. And he really can't. He finds it very, very, very difficult. Um, so really, in many respects, the younger generation are doomed to either repeat the same mistakes or make, or make all new ones. It's really, really sad. And Another Life, which is the last story in the collection it moves it on dramatically it suddenly it cuts away from neil and you've got someone else and in fact it changes everything because this time you've got a more ginger a ginger snap situation where you have the werewolf being female she doesn't know she's a werewolf initially and her discovery of what she is how it comes about through trauma and through abuse and how Neil kind of intersects with her life, how he's found a new state and place in his, I suppose it must be his dotage at this point, he must be getting on quite a bit. He's found a new state and place as a kind of shepherd and protector of his people or of werewolves who don't really know that they're werewolves, who don't really know what they're doing, who are isolated and are just following their own paths. It's a much, it's a really interesting set of stories, this one. It hurtles along at a great pace because they're werewolf stories, you know? Werewolf stories are actually really difficult a lot of the time because it is, there is a tendency for, certainly for horror fans, I find, to kind of roll their eyes and go, mm, you know, when they realise that what they're watching or what they're reading is another werewolf story. It's like vampire stories, you know? There is a tendency for them to be quite saturated. There's a tendency for people to assume that they know what these stories are going to be or what they're going to follow. What Paul has done, it's taken it's exactly what writers and creators of horror should be doing with these old archetypes picking them up and reinventing them to reflect something that's that's very present day that's very postmodern you know concerns and issues that are are what we're facing now in our postmodern existences and states that's exactly what should be done and it works really really well i mean these this is the longer of the books we've read thus far in this series this one is actually 197 pages so nearly 200 pages nearly like novel length you know and it just yeah, it's so fast-paced. It's so action-packed. It's so interesting, and the characters are so interesting. You know, you get behind Neil's eyes, and Neil is really familiar, despite the fact that he is a werewolf. He's not a human being. His experience is incredibly familiar, and will chime with various different readers at different stages of their life. So there is an appeal here there's Rufus again, that crosses generational boundaries, you know, and may even act as a kind of, um, a kind of bridging element, you know, you can actually get some insight into how, you know, if you're a younger man, how older generations work and how they view the young and how they view communication between the generations and vice versa, you know, it's very clever. It's a very cool little collection and I enjoyed it immensely, I've got to say. Different flavour from the others. The others are full on balls to the wall horror. This is more like, it's more action oriented, you know, it's got more of like, um, like a horror comic book or a horror a TV series feeling about it and it works really really well not only that because of the the nature of the collections I've read thus far in this series it acts as a nice palette cleanser it gives you a different flavor a different feeling which is part of the strength of reading these books one after the other or as a series very very cool indeed when we come back my loves we will have another from the Black Shuck Shadow series until then bye bye Ha <laughs> 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 